are you? Welcome to LSB Feasters Radio Channel, where we keep great radio from the past alive. And today, we're going to New York City and News Radio 88 WCBS. WCBS was a staple for New York City for decades, delivering breaking news and information to its listeners. WCBS was known for its in-depth coverage of local, national, and international events. The station has played a vital role in keeping New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut informed. WCBS had a team of experienced journalists and reporters like Charles Osgood, Lou Adler, Jim Donnelly, Pat Parson, Ben Farnsworth, Don Swain, Jeff Kaplan, Wayne Cabot, and so many other names have kept New Yorkers informed. The station's commitment to providing reliable and accurate news has made it a trusted source for countless New Yorkers. From the station's launch in 1967 till it came to an end in 2024. In August 2024, the company that owned WCBS, Odyssey, decided the station would no longer continue with its all-news format. Odyssey would keep 880 in its stable of stations while Good Karma Broadcasting would program the station and flip it to ESPN New York. All right, let's listen to the final moments before the flip and the launch of ESPN Radio on News Radio 880 WCBS New York. Don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone? Oh boy, it's Wayne Cabot as we say goodbye. This is it. We're just minutes away. And I want to take these last few minutes to be quiet, which is something Paul Murnane has wished for for a very long time. Paul, you will get your wish for the next few minutes as I play the sounds of WCBS through the years. You ready? 1960s, the headline sound. CBS Network Alert. 1970s, the chopper. Headline stories. WCBS Bulletin. WCBS Special. News 88 Business. News 88 Update. Ah, here's everyone's favorite. We never should have stopped playing these. We should have kept paying Steve Carmen as much as he wanted. Everyone remembers and loves. News is from the guy who composed so many great themes. We'll start with the real big one. Yeah, he was the guy behind I Love New York. When you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Sooner or later, you'll own generals. Trust the Midas touch. And have you ever heard the jingle? Nationwide is on your side. And here's what my friend, Steve Carmen did for us. 1989. This one didn't last very long. Headlines. Traffic. WCBS News Time 315. Time for News 88 Sports. And the big sports story today involves. Kevin McReynolds, who has extended his lease at Shea Stadium in a very big way. Howard Cannon has more about that. It was supposed to be Kevin McReynolds' day at three-year contract. Now the 90s, more than just the headlines. Traffic. The headlines approach.
approaching CBS News on the Hour. News, traffic, and weather for New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. We are News Radio, WCBS 880. Big theme music. Top of the hour. Two thousands. This just in. Network rejoin. Live from the CBS Hudson Square Broadcast Center in Manhattan. We are News Radio WCBS HD and WCBS FM HD Two New York. This just in to the WCBS Newsroom. Now, CBS Top of the Hour, 60s to today. for a CBS Radio Net Alert Bulletin. The Chirp. CBS Radio Special Report. CBS Radio Sports. This is Win Elliott for CBS Radio Sports Central USA. Every referee signal on a playing field has a special meaning, and now on CBS Radio, we've got a new set of signals that means great listening on this station. Our sports signature sounds like this. It means my sports central USA. This is Douglas Edwards. CBS News on the hour is the sound of news in the making, and this sound introduces our comprehensive news coverage. Distinctively CBS Radio, signaling CBS News. Listen for the signature. And you'll be listening to CBS News on CBS Radio, where what you want to know comes first. Good morning. This is Steve Porter welcoming you to WCBS News Radio 88. Good morning. This is Charles Osgood, News Radio 88. Tune to the best news source around WCBS News Radio 88. Local and regional developments coming right up. This is Bill Fahan. It's five minutes past four o'clock. Temperature 34 degrees. The winds east southeast at 10 to 18 miles per hour. You know him, don't you? That's Bob Harris. Do you know me? Many people in the West Village. News 88 WCBS in New York, 27th of November, a Monday, 36 degrees, 5:30. The news on us. Headlines. A lot of snow on us today. Season's first snarls traffic. Four tones will follow. The final loudest one marks the exact time. We've been marking time for a lifetime, and now it's over. It's midnight. The power of that amazing signal there, 50,000 watts pulsating out, will continue 
as these names go away. We take these last minutes to celebrate our relationship, yours and mine, and Paul's and Bridget's and Michael and Steve and Tanya and Levon and on and on to Pat's, Parson, Farnack, Carol, Jeff Kaplan, Deborah Rodriguez, Gary Moore, Ben Farnsworth, Jim Donnelly, Lou Adler, Charles Osgood, Steve Porter, Harvey Hobman, Rita Sands, Tom Franklin, Bill Fayen, Bob Glenn, John Wydra, Palmer Payne, Alan Shaw, Ralph Howard, Greg Baker, Bob Gibson, Jack Welby, Harley Carnes, Therese Crowley, Vicki Allen, John Metaxas, Jim Taylor, John Miller, John Lesher, Joe Avalar, Anita Bonita, Kathy Carpin, B.J. Fennell, I remember you, B.J., Mitch Levy, nicest guy in the world, Mike Sugarman, Janice Wright, Steve Knight, Karen Regal, Mary Alice Williams, Ed Crane, Maria Garcia, Cameron Swayze, Bud Mishkin, Suzanne Colucci, Ashok Bala, Bill Whitney, Dick Reeves, Rich Lamb, Peter Haskell, Marla Diamond, Sean Adams, Fran Schneido, Alex Silverman, Ellen Mitchell, Sophia Hall, Mac Rosenberg, Mike Zirinex, Bob Vosberg, Jeff Grant, Lisa Fantino, Frank Cipolla, Doug Spiro, Darlene Pomales, Linda Zoman, Steve Malave, Mike Smeltz, Sean Colfard, a.k.a. Michael Cole, Catherine Chaffee, Bob Brown, Eric Scott, Gordon Deal, Kelly Waldron, Jim Ascendio, Jerry Nachman, Jane Tillman Irving, Mary Gay Taylor, Fred Fishkin, Walt Wheeler, Ed Bradley, Tim Sheld, and the renowned reporters for whom awards are named and still handed out, Art Athens, Steve Flanders, Edward R. Murrow. Lou Timolot, Tom Salat, Terry Raskin, Joe Nolan, Chris Majette, Jim Feldman, Andre Farrow, Tom O'Hanlon, Russ Meyer, Lori Jordan, Lou Adams, Debbie Mazzella, Neil Bush, Tom Kaminsky, Dr. Just Plain Bob Harris, Norm MacDonald, Bill Corbell, Gordon Barnes, Todd Glickman, Craig Allen, Brad Heller, Jared Max, Gordon Damer, Kevin Burkhart, Kevin Connors, Bill Daughtry, Bill Schweitzer, Rich Ackerman, Howie Carpen, Tommy Tide. Todd Ant, Gary Stanley, Howard Cannon, Spencer Ross, Barry Landers, Howie Rose, Len Berman, Pat Summerall, Ed Ingalls, Gordon Williams, Ray Hoffman, Dean Shepard, Ken Pruitt, Joe Connolly, the CBS Radio Network, and its legions of correspondents, reporters, anchors, and commentators, Harry Reisner, Dan Rather, Walter Cronkite, The Osgood File. Now, what I did there was probably a huge mistake, because these are the people just off the top of my head. If I forgot you, I didn't forget you. This is all just happening so fast. But a special nod to one man who was a producer, a writer, reporter, and anchor over the years, and who had, and has, CBS in his blood, who maintains the most thorough and loving website of WCBS News Radio, and that's a man I'm proud to call my friend, Don Swaim. And thanks to all of his contributors, most notably John Landers, on the WCBS News Radio 88 Appreciation site. Go to it. It's amazing. Now, if we had hours, not just minutes left, we would name all the people you've never heard on the air, except in the credits, supporting those of us on the air and supporting journalism. The legions of people behind the scenes writing, producing, engineering are an innumerable and invaluable part of our history. Wicked smart people showing up at all hours, weekends, Thanksgiving, Christmas, so that whenever you turned on 880, you were closer to your world. The WCBS passion and pride spilled into a sales force that revered these call letters and the CBS legacy every bit as much as you and I do. Advocates for our craft who showed advertisers how we, the audience, are smart, discerning, engaging, and caring. Caring. We have given our advertising dollars and our charitable dollars through so many hunger thons, for example. You held us to a high standard and let us know when we didn't hit the mark. All of us here knew that our audience is engaged and smart, and we knew to treat our audience with the respect that a well informed, well educated news consumer deserves. That's right, deserves. Our news desert is getting bigger and drier. And just like we should get a second medical opinion, we need to seek out more and more varied news sources that we trust. Because getting your information without the bias and brainwashing in one place has given way to a, a fight to stay informed. With each closing newspaper, radio newsroom, TV newsroom, magazine, and now even digital news operations, the country we love is diminished. So as we leave the news ecosystem after 57 years of all news and 100 years of service on New York Radio, we implore you to find that next trusted source. Use it, support it, in word and deed. 
it is the most patriotic thing you can do, and the most satisfying. To paraphrase a CBS News legend, good night and good luck. You will ask, why does this radio station mean so much? Why is the reaction the way it is? And I really can't speak for others. I can speak for myself. My parents split when I was 11. We split Christmas, and when I was at Dad's house, he gave me a clock. And this one had a beam at the top that shined the time onto the ceiling. I wanted to make sure it was set correctly, so I went to the station I heard in the back of the car, WCBS, to make sure the time was exactly right. And I listened and listened, and before long, I became hooked as a 12, 13-year-old. When I was 14, my dad drove me to the radio station in New York City during morning rush hour traffic. And he introduced me to the place I'm now signing off in 2024. Ray Martel, here's your last request. Chris Olivero, Ben Meverek, Ivan Lee, our bosses pushed for and got the authority to let us have our goodbyes, to have a last show. That's something very rare. I thank them for that. And I thank my dad for driving me into New York City in 1978. Parents, you never know what impact these random acts of love and attention may have on your children. I'm Wayne Cabot, and for the final time, this is WCBS New York. WHSQ and WCBS FM HD2, New York. Puts their lead over the Braves in the NL East to six after Atlanta's loss to Washington. Girls and Astros played in Sunday Night Baseball. Houston Salvage just put in a four game series in Baltimore, winning by a count of six to three. Royals out. Game and a half back of the Yankees. That's because Aaron Judge hit his 50th and 51st home runs of the year as the Yankees rolled past the Rockies 10 to 3. The Diamondbacks have now won six in a row. They finished off a sweep of the White Sox with a 7-5 victory. Arizona sits atop the wild card race, but remains three back of the first place Dodgers. In the NL West, LA beat Tampa three to one. Lake Barrier, Florida is Little League World Series champion. They do it in dramatic fashion, falling behind but coming back to win two to one in eight innings. Hey, it's Michelle Smallman, and coming up Monday, college football is underway, and I'm going to tell you who the biggest threat is to Ohio State and Georgia. It's on Sportsman, like 6 a.m. Eastern, right here on ESPN Radio, ESPN2, and ESPN U. Coming up Monday morning at 6 o'clock on DPH on Rothenberg, we break down the Jets and Giants preseason, the Yankees, and the Mets as well. It's Monday at 6 on ESPN. This is Game Night on ESPN Radio and on the ESPN app. You're listening to Game Night on ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, and Sirius XM Channel 80. Harrison Stanford and Jonathan Zaslow with you. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. If you want to tap in with us throughout the course of the night, one 729 say espn And week zero has come to a close. We saw a top 25 defeat, Georgia Tech, getting a last second field goal to take down number 10, which we don't expect to be number 10 anymore, Florida State. Grace Raynor joining us now, the athletic college football writer. Grace, my question to you, is this more about Florida State or is this more about Georgia Tech? Could we actually see Georgia Tech actually be a factor when it comes down to winning the ACC championship or getting to the college football playoff? I think it's a little bit 
of both. I think Georgia Tech was better than we all expected, and Florida State was maybe a little bit worse. And I'm not sure that we're ready to declare Georgia Tech the kings of the ACC. They'll still have to go through Miami, Clemson. Um, I'm sure they're going to have something to say in the ACC race. But this is a really good Georgia Tech team, and I think they do deserve their flowers. I mean, King, King played really well. This is an offensive line that returned four of their five starters and then brought in a um, really experienced right guard in Keelan Rutledge from Middle Tennessee. They've got the pieces that they need, I think, to really compete. They do have a gauntlet of a schedule. Um, and then Florida State, we all thought that they were going to be the favorites to win the ACC. We figured they'd just kind of reload. Um, and they've got some questions to answer. This is a game that um, went lopsided for them, and, and I think we have to kind of recount what our expectations are for them in the conference race. But I think it's a little bit of both, to your point. Grace, what did you make of DJ Uyagalale's performance? I thought that DJ was was solid, uh, maybe not necessarily dominant. I mean, I just think that this is a guy that uh, we know how capable he can be when he's really clicking. He has a huge arm. He's a really effective runner. But he hasn't been a guy that's been a super consistent, super accurate downfield passer, and I thought we saw that again um, in week zero. I don't know that they really cut him loose. Um, he didn't. He had, obviously, those huge, those two huge throws on fourth down um, when they were trying to mount their comeback. But other than that, I just kind of felt like they didn't. They weren't ready to, to totally take him off the leash yet. And I was surprised that they didn't use him more as a runner. I mean, this is a guy who's 250 pounds, 6 um, one of the most effective running quarterbacks in the ACC. So I thought he was, I thought he was fine. I thought he, he played well, but uh, I think they're going to need a little bit more out of him down the stretch. You're tapped in with Game Night on ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, and Sirius XM Channel 80. Harrison Stanford, Jonathan Zaslow, right here on Game Night, joined by Grace Rayner, the athletic college football writer. Uh, part of the reason, Grace, why DJ Uwe Ungolale did not play at a high level, or at least many would think, is because of the defense constructed by Tyler Santucci, the defensive coordinator for Georgia Tech, who came from Duke. I'm wondering if you think there are any other hires in the world of college football or the ACC that you think can have a really big impact on a team's offensive unit, defensive unit, or overall in general? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, this isn't a new hire. Obviously, we saw him last year, but I think I would say Garrett Riley at Clemson is probably the hire that I'm the most intrigued by this year now that he's had a full year to get his system in and work with Cade Klubnik, and that's an offense that has struggled uh, really since Trevor Lawrence left. So I'm curious to see what they look like this year and year two with Klubnik and Riley. Obviously, we saw how much he could do at TCU and just the way he schemed guys open. Um, so not a fresh hire, but he's still new enough to that I think he's got our attention, uh, especially as they open up with Georgia and big one. Grace, so looking at the 12-team college football playoff, we're, we're all going to, I guess, learn together, you know, what you know, what a loss here or a loss there winds up meaning. In the past, FSU loses this opening game against Georgia Tech, and we're probably all saying, all right, you're, you're in big trouble. But now, because it's a 12-team playoff, what does yesterday's loss mean for FSU big picture? Yeah, I th- I'm right with you. Like, we're going to figure it out together, right? I mean, yes, to your point, it would have been an absolute dagger. Uh, just this time a year ago. I mean, we're talking about a Florida State team that went undefeated and still didn't make it a year ago. Um, so I think they've got a little bit more wiggle room. Uh, they can win the ACC. They're, they're going to have a pass in. Uh, they can maybe get a big win against Clemson and or Miami, just depending on how things shake out around them. Maybe they're looking at an at-large bid. Um, so they don't have a ton of room for error, but I don't think it's, you know, Florida State's chances are completely dead. Uh, we'll see kind of what, what shakes out around them, but um, I do think that they need to clean some things up and kind of figure out where they're headed um, and then maybe have some dominoes around them fall their way too. Grace Rayner, athletic college football writer, joining us right here on Game Night on ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, Series XM Channel 80, Harrison Stanford and Jonathan Zaslow. Uh, as we look at the week one college football schedule, we do have some top 25 matchups Sunday, September 1st, USC taking on LSU. You also have Notre Dame takes, taking on Texas A&M. Out of all the matchups that are happening in official week one, what, which game is the most intriguing to you and why? I do like that Notre Dame and M matchup. I think seeing Riley Leonard go up against his old coach and Mike Elko in week one is going to be really interesting. I'm curious to see how he kind of slides into that Notre Dame offense. Um, I think Connor Wigman is, is poised for a big season. So I've got my 
that one. I will be at Clemson, Georgia. So, of course, that's going to be one that I'm going to be monitoring. Um, curious to see what this Clemson offense looks like. And just, I would assume Georgia's probably going to look like they're in midseason form, just uh, probably the most talented team top to bottom in the country. Um, so, yeah, those are probably the two that I'm, I'm the most excited about. And, you know, before we let you go here, Grace, uh, if we can take a look at the SEC for a moment here. I mean, the SEC loves to brag every single year, obviously. Best conference, best league. But you got a Texas team that is entering the SEC, not just with, you know, uh, uh, aspirations to win the SEC, but to win the national championship. So what do we make of the chances of an outsider like Texas being able to compete right away in the Southeastern Conference? Yeah, I mean, I think Texas is joining the SEC at a great time. I mean, this is a program that had a lot of momentum last year and um, it obviously made the playoffs and Quinn Ewers is a, is a Heisman contender. Um, the SEC, to your point, is the, the most uh, daunting conference in the country, so they're going to have to be ready to play big boy football immediately, but that's the great thing about the 12-team playoffs, too, right? Everyone kind of has a chance. Um, obviously, I know they've lost some pieces. They've had some, some injuries that they're going to have to work around and kind of figure out where they're headed in that direction, but um, I think anyone who is entering this, this preseason as a top 15 team has a shot when it's all said and done. Grace, I know a lot of people this time of year are da- uh, dabbling around with their ESPN bet app. Uh, as somebody who covers the sport, can you name the one team, you can only pick one team now, outside of the obvious, that wins the national championship? So we're eliminating the Oregons, the Ohio States, the Alabamas, uh, the Georgias of the world. Name the one team that can creep into the playoff and really make some noise. Oh, man. I mean, Oregon was my pick uh, in the preseason. I think Georgia's obviously probably Yeah, but those, are the e- uh, but those are the easy ones, Grace. You know that. <laughs> all right. Give me a... Uh, what about Mizzou? Or, well, actually, can I have two? Oh, Miss or Mizzou? I like both of them. Uh, they're both... Mizzou's kind of a I love Luther Burden. I think that they are kind of a sleeper team. A lot of people in the SEC have liked them. Um, Ole Miss is returning Jackson Dart. I do think we're going to see one of the teams that we're expecting to win it to win it all, but um, I like the way Ole Miss and I like the way Mizzou are both. Yeah, a little shot there to win Heisman Trophy as well. I think that's a good play right there. All right, Grace, thank you for joining us here on Game Night. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. I appreciate it. Week zero of the college football season is over. Real quick, Jonathan, be- yeah. before we get into more NFL action, is Florida State done? No. Are they, no, are they, a, college fo- are they a college football playoff team? Yeah, I, I I think so. I think they are. I mean, before yesterday, I put together my college football playoff predictions, and before yesterday, I, I have them winning the ACC, and that could still be the case. It's just the problem because you know you, you could you could represent, you can get to the ACC championship game without being undefeated in conference. All right, sure. so you know they lose this game to Georgia Tech. It just means you know games against Clemson, games against Miami. You probably got to win both of those now, and you can't trip up, you know, with one of the other in-conference games. You know, you, you figured going into the start of the season, Georgia Tech, neutral site, that n- nobody counted that as one of FSU's conference losses. So, yeah, I still think FSU is a playoff team. I absolutely still think FSU is in play for the ACC championship, but, you know, I'm down here in South Florida. I grew up a Hurricanes fan. Hurricane fans were loving Yesterday, all right. That just makes potentially the road to an AC championship game easier for someone not called FSU. Yeah, obviously, Hurricanes fans should be excited with Cam Ward there, quarterback. You know, another interesting team in the ACC is North Carolina. After their week one matchup against Minnesota, and I saw this on College Game Day Saturday morning, they don't go more than 10 miles away for their, for, from their campus until November. Wow. Very local home cooking there for the Tar Heels, who have a big tour of replacing Drake May, who played fairly well in the Patriots' preseason finale. Let's hear from their head coach, Gerard Mayo and May, Right here on Game Night on ESPN Radio. That's coming up next. This is ESPN Radio. Matthew Judon to the Atlanta Falcons. Bird call! <laughs> on your radio, your computer, your smart speaker, or on the ESPN app. On the CJ Stroud or no-brainer. CJ Stroud's a no-brainer over Joe Burrow. Yes. We're everywhere you are. This is ESPN Radio.